Well, one of the things I've been meaning to ask you, and maybe I'll just jump in and give you the really broad mm -hmm. question, is how should somebody know if they're meant to play the drums? <laughs> um, wow. I mean, there is this cliche thing of saying, oh, if you if you ask that question, then it's probably not for you, right? But uh, I, I've always found that a little, little harsh because I think um, at least I was that way um, regarding relationships sometimes or important decisions that when something really, really mattered to me, then I did have doubts because I didn't want to mess it up. I didn't want to, it was so important to me and I didn't want to fuck it up. So I, I, I was like, okay, oh, is this really what I want? You know, or like the decision to become a father, you know, like these are all like decisions where, where you feel the weight of it and, and, and you don't want to mess it up. So I think it's okay to doubt and to ask yourself and in, in, in danger of making my answer now even more complex and, and, and weird is um, that I sometimes don't think that you have to know it. And from the beginning, I think we sometimes um, get the information we need on the way. So um, you might feel a certain attraction or um, like this magnetic feeling to something. And then, um, but I do believe and this is maybe my answer then, that you should follow this. Uh, if, if you feel an attraction uh, and and if you um, feel like, oh man, this this is nice, this somehow gets me, this somehow turns me on, then then try it out and, and, and go there. And then you will figure out more and more how difficult it is <laughs> and and maybe um, how beautiful it is as well and and then you can constantly decide like how the ratio seems for you and um i think that's all you can do in life really but the only thing we usually regret is when we don't follow that uh that feeling so yeah how did the drums feel to you when you first started did it feel like it came naturally did it feel like immediately there was an affinity or did it take some time yeah, it really felt like, oh, this is nice. Like it always was, oh, look at that. Like, um, and, and I, and I can compare it because I played other instruments before I played the drums. So I, I played a little bit of piano and, and, and trumpet and I still like those instruments and I like to hear them and I like when others play them, especially, <laughs> but, but with the drums, it was like, oh man, I would like to do that. And, and, um, it had this fascination to me. How much difference do you think genetic talent makes? Uh, this is a tough one because, I mean, I, I love books like um, the one where the title says what, what also I think my, my attitude to this is, which means talent is overrated. Fantastic book I can recommend to everyone. Um, and... I am a drummer and a musician and uh, I write music and I uh, do that, but I'm also an educator and my educator heart even more um, and also my practical day-to-day -day life, going through day-to-day -day life heart tells me that even if there is such a thing as talent and even if it plays um, a role, why, why thinking about it? You know, like I, I really want to, when I teach with someone or I, I, um, I advise people or if, when I make decisions, I, I want to, I want to ignore that as much as I can, because sometimes when you, we've all seen as educators, people that, that are very determined and love the thing so much that they can surpass people with a more natural, um, proclivity towards something where you in the beginning think like it's almost unfair how someone can be, have such a natural approach, approach to the instrument and you look at it and be like man I practiced for weeks and this guy just goes there or this girl just goes there and does it um, but so I think and also 
I've I've had uh, students were or or colleagues where I sometimes thought like man he's he has to fight harder than than maybe some other people but that's fine for him because he loves it so much um, that uh, why not and so um, how big that part is that it plays I don't know but it's not something that uh, you should listen to a lot I think. You should listen to what you want and what you want to get better at and whether it's worth it for you. Yeah, that's one of the nice things and also one of the difficult things about art is that there's not really any wrong answer. So if you're getting pleasure from the drums, it's, if playing the drums is making you happy, then who's to say that that's wrong? And the way I tend to think about it, especially recently, is that the end goal should should all come down to being happy and enjoying it. Because if it sucks, yeah. if you hate it every day, why do it? And so, yeah. Yeah. There's also this entertainer part in me, though. I, I once heard an... I'm saying this because I heard... Uh, a light bulb went off when I heard um, Stephen Fry talk about like the three aspects of... I don't know how the umbrella he put it under, but but... It wasn't an answer to someone said like, oh, you're such a great artist. You write book, you're an actor, you're a comedian. You're, um, uh, uh, you're such a great actor. And he, uh, no, he said, uh, you're such a great artist, they said. And he said like, I'm afraid I'm not, a, I'm not an artist. Uh, and, and they were like, how so? And then he explained that uh, he has this entertainer side. So he wants to be loved and he wants, to, uh, he wants the audience to be happy. And he has this craftsman side that means he's perfectly fine like doing something that's nice like someone would make a chair and 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 if the chair is well done out of wood and 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 the the maker is happy then the maker will be like okay i will make this chair again and again and again with with excellence and with with beauty and grace and and then that's fine for for the for the craftsman but an artist a hardcore artist will usually be like I have to do this, then he does it, doesn't care whether people like it or not, maybe sometimes even takes pride in if people hate it, <laughs> but but he has to do it, uh, that's the artist thing. And once he's done it, he wants to do something else, like he, he has to move on to something else. And the entertainer does something for the audience and wants, that, wants people to be happy and wants to get applause and stuff like that. And I realized, and for me, it has been a good compass to think, oh, I think all of us, we have those three parts, especially as drummers, I think, um, but probably in every field. And it's it's cool for us to to ask ourselves, like, how is the balance between those three things? Some people are more artistic and um more about self-expression and some are more like craftsmen they 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 really enjoy perfecting this and if they've done something they want to repeat it and maybe do the same announcement every night or the same licks every night and enjoy that you know and some are like no it's got to be new every it has to be a constant creation thing and um so so in that term then you have other parameters that you that guide you because you said like hey as long as you like it well the entertainer will not be happy as long as he he does a comedy show he's fine no he wants people to laugh and when people don't laugh he's not happy so so i think that's also a thing of like what's your goal as a as a drummer as a musician as an artist as a human to be like okay why am i actually doing this and i have to admit um that i have this entertainer part also in me i want people to have a good time at concerts or when they watch a video um I, there is a part of me that wants wants to be liked you know but there's also this artist thing of like ah this is boring i gotta i gotta do this and i feel like i'm doing this although everyone telling me this is stupid or weird so but it's these three things really help me and it also helps to uncover um why maybe something is missing or why maybe the result doesn't work uh sorry that just reminded me of that and for, for me it's a great uh, um, a great navigation tool um, to see also like to take in account reactions and 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 my own feelings about this that leads me to a question i wanted to ask as well 
which is there is kind of this paradox built in between art being subjective, but also skills gradients being real. For instance, yeah. Pablo Picasso painted painted cubist stuff that, that wasn't representational, but he needed to, to gain a lot of skill to do that. So this may be piggybacking on what you just said, but if art is subjective, what are we getting better at when we practice? Nietzsche once said, become who you are, right? I think that's one of the artist journeys to be like, I'm doing this, but... I mean, I have these moments sometimes where I have to be honest to myself and be like, oh man, I'm doing this. I'm I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying the heck out of this. But I'm enjoying it because I love Dave Wackel. And <laughs> I I've practiced this and, and now I'm I'm like, oh man, this is this Dave Wackel thing. <laughs> and 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 uh yeah, so <sighs> Is that really me? Is that really what I wanted to do, or is that me proving to myself that I um, I I now have the skills a little bit more, at least, to understand a little bit more what my childhood heroes, like or my teenage heroes and still heroes, uh, are doing? Um, yeah, I think. Yeah. Man, tough question. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm thinking about it in real time too. I I think workshopping our ideas gives us better ideas too. Like true. If, if, if you've never painted before, sure, you could theoretically do anything you want, but you don't have any ideas. You, you don't have any context like, and there's, yeah. a, there's a language and a tradition and, and that's yeah. certainly the same with the drums. I mean, the instrument looks the way it does and it has the sounds and the equipment it does for specific reasons, just like the piano. It's like you could sit down at the piano and just play gibberish, but why ignore the centuries of things people have worked out on the piano? Because at least that's a, yeah. a springboard to, to doing what you want to do. Yeah, and there's this incredible um, uh, um, research that was done about... Um, I think these two pottery classes, it was the first pottery class. They were all beginner amateur uh, people. And they, they said to the one group, like, hey, we want you to do the most perfect pots that you can. Um, and the other group was told, hey, make as many pots as you can until the end of the week. And the ones and the best and most perfect pots came from the ones that focused on quantity and not on quality. And I think that's also a point of like, I think we think about that a lot with um, with our actual skills and motor skills, but also the manifestation of uh, this is my vision. This is who maybe I think I am or want to be, and and this is how I can then manifest it. Is also a part of that chain that we sometimes forget, and this is also like a muscle I think strengthened by the frequency of how how often we engage in that exercise. So yeah, definitely. I think everyone has to figure that out for themselves and will also part of figuring that out because that always sounds like, oh, that's a fixed point and then I have to get there and find my way there or drill down. But that is, of course, um, I think a huge part of this journey uh, is course correction and, and, and growing and changing your mind and learning more and being like, oh, damn, I thought this was my thing, but... But I now find this disgusting. I want to do something else. So, so yeah. <laughs> Was there a point for you where you felt like you passed the threshold? And even though we're all continuing to improve and work toward our, our goals and create new goals and that, that, that finish line keeps receding, did you feel like there was a point you passed after which you enjoyed things more consistently when you sat down to play? Of course, it's a gradual, very gradual, slow process. But I think I had this realization once where I realized, you know what? I don't hate everything I play anymore. Like there was a time where I was always disappointed with recordings of mine and and with, with like recordings from performances, but even like recordings. <laughs> and... Um, but I also kind of deliberately 
tried around parallel to it like how to get out of that but at, at a certain point i just realized like you know what like this this now happens more and more like that that i that i listened to something and was like hey you know what first of all i can remember what i actually did i wasn't so flushed by like um, adrenaline that i don't even know what the fuck i was doing anymore um, so, so the awareness became better first, where I felt I had a little bit more control live and uh, while playing. And then um, and then I had a little bit more control in terms of, oh, this goes in the wrong direction. I want this uh, or or just feeling like, man, I'm nervous as heck or or I, I have to focus a little bit more. I'm maybe I haven't slept enough, I'm I'm jet lagged or whatever. So f- just being aware of what's going on before things go terribly wrong and and yeah and then i think in yeah that was like when i was around 25 or something where where i really worked a lot on this and and really um got closer to being able to control what i've learned the years before and i'm still on that journey of course definitely do you feel like you have kind of a an operating system in your head that when you coach students, you're kind of able to look at where a student is and because of all of the lessons you've chunked over time, kind of understand what they need to do to to get them there fastest. And I know this is a big question, but have you found identified any commonalities in terms of like common blockers you see in students? I'd be super curious to hear your take on that. So I have these these uh, four to five fields that I definitely always want to poke at, and and I think that everything can kind of falls into roughly these these categories. Um, the the ones would be definitely time, um, and and so before I go into it, I, what I find fascinating about it is that sometimes people uh, don't become better at something because they they think what they need is in a different drawer than it actually is so the solution is somewhere else and they always drill from this one direction and and you think like no no it's it's not that so so a a classic and and uh, i'm sorry to everyone who's listening maybe i'm i'm sounding like a broken record but this one thing that always fascinated me is that that people always said like okay you know you gotta practice with a quarter note click and you would just become better over time and your time will be everything will become better your time your pulse your subdivision will become more even it will groove more it will feel more like pocket it will and i'm like and i've seen that when people practice that and i tried it myself and that was not my experience and 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 when i realized oh for tempo change like i uh, or or when rushing and dragging on uh, without wanting it um a gap click is really great or or for for if i want a certain flow and a certain calmness that i heard with guys like steve gad or where i always was fascinated like and it just felt like so smooth and linear and sometimes when i listen to my 16th note grooves it, it felt like a little bumpy at times and just this feeling and quality i was like fuck what, <laughs> what the hell and and i realized no that comes from from basically a consistency of subdivision and accuracy of, of placement of these flows of subdivision and and to just find that out and 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 of course there's technique needed to be able to do that but first to have the to have the diagn- the proper diagnosis and there is this saying in medicine that says the proper diagnosis is half the cure and that's what i think one of the important jobs of the teacher of course is to be like hey you know what like i think it's because of that or i help you categorize this and that and and um yeah there are many of these things but with with that being said at the same time i'm aware the more advanced um this or not advanced that's the wrong word but the more experienced a teacher is i think the more we also have to always build in to be suspicious of our you know, like, oh, this is my favorite prescription. <laughs> so this is maybe sometimes even something you love to teach or you love to talk about or um, you know you maybe could help the person with. But is it really the thing that the person now wants and needs? 
sometimes what the person wants is different than what it maybe needs as well so so it's all these kind of things that then is really the art of of teaching i think and and uh oh, this diagnose uh, progress or uh, process do you have any pet peeves about things that you feel like are overemphasized in drum education writ large that <laughs> don't as you say get to the heart they're not in the drawer to use your nomenclature of the things that most students need to break through oh man yeah i have many but <laughs> um i'm not trying to get um, you in trouble <laughs> now that i mean it's just hard to pick um <sighs> well i'll tell you one of mine recently is is this idea of independence as as an overarching concept like i need to work on my rudiments my groove my soloing and my independence like independence is some some magic skill and i may be wrong speaking of questioning our biases but my current hot take on that is that independence as an overarching category is a fiction that we, oh really we we do better just if we want to play independently on a jazz swing beat just practicing that or if we want to right. if we want clave in the last left foot like just practice that uh if right if right we want so to, embedded in more of a, of a of a task or a style or something that you have to do anyway that's then part of a goal that you have so to speak but not the thing itself yeah that's fascinating see because because independence is one of those things Uh, that I enjoyed really taking separately and being like, okay, you know what, I'm going to check this shit out. And, and it, it, it was really a phasis of my life where I was like, okay, wow, I, I, I didn't feel like I have an access to that. But now when I really isolate it and just look at that of like, oh, how does that feel when they come together and then apart? And like, I would say it did help me a lot, but maybe um, if a teacher would have just been like, let's do some jazz stuff, let's do some Latin stuff. Maybe it would have been the same thing, of course. But see, that's also interesting because, yeah, sometimes these things can be packaged. It's the same with technique and sound. I, I, I figured out that some people really that say that they teach technique, they really teach uh, sound and speed. Some people that teach um, sound stuff really teach uh, kind of... The, how to how to approach the drums and how to play a hi-hat properly and so 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 they are very interdependent these 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 subjects and sometimes um the one encompasses the other <sighs> i think for me it's maybe um like turning but i i hope i will not get into but anyway <laughs> don't worry i, I won't this publish this anywhere <laughs> yeah yeah It's just us, right? No yeah, one is exactly. listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I got, I got in. I said this at PASIC once, and and of course, people were like, oh, "There was a gasp in the room." Um, but I, I sometimes think what is maybe overused, or maybe, yeah, it's applying rudiments to the kit. That concept of. Um, so as a technical exercise, that's of course great. And it's also a great next step to make something you learned to hear it sound different, to orchestrate it. And so I get all of that and that's all great. The problem is that I hear very, very often uh, that thinking when someone plays. So someone will do frappete, 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 frappete. And then you hear and it's really like you're changing like radio channels. It's It has nothing to do with the groove. It has nothing to... And it's this thinking of like, oh, I'm not now gonna switching over into... So instead of using these embellishments of notes and these nice kind of sounds that rudiments give you and and maybe some convenience and orchestration of ending on the right or on the left that's all super useful but um but the idea that oh a paradiddle or uh, of um um of whatever flam triplet or swiss triplet is that's the that's a great source of creativity and ideas 
to use as fills that i think is a mis misleading thing a little bit to be like oh this is this is the material that you use to create great fills i think that's a horrible thing to do yeah well it's, it's so limiting, yeah isn't write it? write mm. some comments write some comments i i keep them coming <laughs> well neither of us is saying that rudiments aren't useful like they're they're extremely useful all. it's just maybe they're of course overemphasized as the origin point to figure out things to play creatively on the kit and and piggybacking on that what would you say to somebody who is saying i want to play clean original fills or at least fills that sound like i wrote them out and practice them, but I'm improvising them. Maybe something like Steve Gadd. I'm practicing all mm. these rudiments, but they're not coming through in my playing when I just try to flow. What would you say is missing there? Mm. That's hard to say in general, but I mean, one thing I, I often, I mean, and Steve Gadd is a great example in both directions, because on, on the one side, he clearly uses a lot of uh, this uh, repertoire and vocabulary in fills musically and wonderfully. But the reason why it is musical and wonderful is um, that all the other uh, parameters of that make grooves sound really great then happen in those fills as well. So, so um, what most drummers do is this: they they wonder why when they play a groove, it has a very different sound and energy than when they play a fill. And this is also something that singers and producers are very sensitive to. Um, very often we get, we get um, told off by, <laughs> by these people because, because we, we destroy the flow of the song and the energy level of the song that goes through. And, um, and, that's not so defined for them this feeling of how the music flows by what is played actually it's more defined of um note density roughly then um dynamic changes and also sonic changes so um if you, and most of us drummers we get louder when we play a fill most of us drummers we play all of a sudden toms when we play fills most of us drummers we start on the snare and then go to the toms and then play a crash on the one and there are a couple of things that are just so like it's almost like a tourette syndrome kind of thing where it's like oh, i have to play the crash on the one like i, I cannot do um i haven't trained myself to not do that after four bars and 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 this is, I think, something that that we can work on. And I have this exercise in my drum camps always, where I let a couple of guys play um, play three bars of groove, one bar of fill. That's the only thing I say. And they could play any bar of fill in any groove. They could play different styles, but almost everyone plays a backbeat thing with subdivision on the hi hat. With uh, and then in the fourth bar, they turn to play some toms and then stop with the crash and then begin with the snare because i think we think of fills being oh snare pad stuff then orchestration end. <laughs> and this is kind of the the pathway we go and it usually is enough to already identify these things and then say like let's just not do this let's make a not to do list of of like okay play three bars of groove and one bar of fill but don't use toms, don't end on a crash and don't start on the snare. And everyone will usually play without having practiced licks, grooves that, and, and, and then fills that they never played before. They, they have to think differently and they will with their repertoire be able to do that. And this is, I think, something we have to do. And I think um, Steve Gadd is great at that because his, his fills always sound like groove variations. Um, he's usually very consistent with the subdivision when he has a do do cast do but do cast good but do 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 but it it kind of stays in this kind of in the same kind of vibe and it just is a is a variation on 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 what what came before or serves in the musical purpose as a transition. Um, I was I was once in Italy and. Uh, talked about fills and that we sometimes misunderstand or mi misuse them and blah blah and i said that we use fills like we see space in the music and we fill it up like we use the word almost like and and use it as that and it 
it doesn't have a musical purpose. We we just like fill it all up. We make it full. We not not only <laughs> do we play more notes, but we 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 fill it until it's completely full. All our practice crap. And drummers often recognize themselves in it and feel maybe like caught and be like oh, and laugh a little bit. But at this camp, no one laughed. And I was like, damn, this this didn't work. This one didn't work. And 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 then I asked the translator later, it's like, hey man, why why didn't that work? Like Phil. And he's like, Yeah, because Phil, that word, that word joke of Phil and like didn't work in Italy because they don't call it Phil's. They call it passaggio, which is the word for transition. And that's great because that is a musical purpose of a fill to to have a transition to another part, a transition to another energy level, an ending of a certain part, um, a preparation for the next one. And I think that's also what Steve does. It's like it always has a purpose in 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 the in the song arrangement and in the movement of of the yeah. I could talk about Steve Gadd forever. I love him so much. Yeah, there's a lot of potential avenues there, but but I, I want to, while we're on the subject of teaching on the road and drum camps, there's a story that J.P. Bouvet gave me permission to ask you about, which is you and he were in China or Mongolia or something like that, teaching a clinic for yeah, kids. Yeah, both actually, yeah. And I th- yeah. as he relates the story, I think the the kids were kind of over it and checked out um, and I think maybe he was really tired and he, he was complimenting you because he said you brought like a great energy to it and just started everybody clapping and like got the group going. So I guess the, the question here is like, where does that passion for teaching and teaching rhythm and connecting with people around the world come from? I don't know. I think I, I was, I, I, this clinic stuff is weird because it really connects like a couple of things that I love. I, I love uh, this stand-up comedy kind of thing that you can get in there. Uh, I love the playing music kind of part that you can do. Some people don't take it serious, but but I think a clinic can be like a good concert if if you if you if you you know do your best and if if the sound is nice and and yeah in. And it's of course an educational thing. It's almost like a lesson workshop kind of thing, but but it can be very entertaining if you want to. You can tell some silly stories and, and make a fool out of yourself. And and that's my tool a little bit. Uh, when when I do clinics, I I usually make a fool out of myself. In and that does two things that are incredibly useful. The first one is um, that that it stops this hierarchy thing that often happens when there's this, oh, now you have someone to teach you and and then it becomes very serious or there are some clinicians who are also at fault, uh, like even making this worse of like, yeah, they, they, this is very hard and like you got to work hard. And, and so this whole energy um, is not so much mine. I'm more like, like, um, there are also presenters in other fields that do this to be like, you know, I'm doing this trick now, but it's very, very hard and I sacrifice this and that for this. Or there are magicians who do it and and make it seem easy and make it seem wondrous and make it be like, hey, isn't that great? And of course, there is there is work behind it. And of course, uh, you have to want it to get it to a good level. But but um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's a privilege to do that. And it's it's. Man, it's just so much fun, and and especially with those kids. I remember that it was. Um, I think we even um, had something bad to eat, like the day before, or something like that. It, it was tough to get. It was tough to motivate yourself, but um, the the thing is also when you're on tour and when you teach and when you hang with different people and stuff. It's sometimes people think like, oh, you do this um, to have a better to to give people a better time but the other aspect is it's also more enjoyable if you give a little bit more into it so uh, you can sometimes put something out of a rut rut a little bit and out of a but uh, so that's i think what comes to mind in that situation where i would sometimes go maybe in the opposite almost of like thinking like oh man this is tough this is this is rough and like okay you know let's 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 make the best out of this but as far as I remember, I think I used the opportunity 
And it could have gone wrong too. I mean, it's all, all, always great these stories when it's like, man, and it was amazing. It could have gone wrong too. But I, I, I think I was like, you know, I want to give them a history lesson about drums. I would just go up there and be like, okay, this is how it started. This is the hi hat. This is the blah, and this is different styles. And and that was nice because it was kind of a, it was almost like a telling a fairy tale or a little history lessons with examples. And so they were watching almost a movie, like a guy who was making a making a fool out of himself and, and and trying to do some things for them. But thanks, JP. Awesome. JP played amazing at that tour as well. It was was pretty a treat to see him like going crazy every night as well. Yeah, he's great. And anyway, that approach to teaching harkens back to your umbrella analogy, right? Where you have those sort of three alter egos and one of them is entertainer. And I, I can feel yeah. that the entertainment aspect is important to you. I want to pivot a little bit and ask about the role of competition in music, because one thing that's, how do I put this? I, I feel like there's kind of an elephant in the room that people really, really like to watch drum sheds, but no one acknowledges yeah. that. And, yeah. you know, I, I do, I do jujitsu, um, not, not to, not to make this about that, but one thing about martial arts is that it makes you better to see how your abilities compare to someone else's in real time when they're meeting resistance, right? Like that's part of the reason yeah. why some of these old martial arts don't work in the real world. There's no one's tested them in real life for, for right. centuries. So do you feel like there's a role, at least in this in a friendly spirit where everybody knows it's all about getting better together of two drummers setting up kids office hit each other and, and chopping it up. Yeah. I think first of all, I have to say like I, I wasn't exposed to that so much. I think this is a very American thing. Um the like this this um drum shed kind of thing, people getting together and um the, it's I had that a little bit when I studied music, um that of course the drummers get together and play together in the room. But um it didn't have that i mean when when that then came came uh when youtube happened and that kind of like uh, it was almost a sensation to kind of to watch and be like oh my god um but um yeah i i think it can have a positive thing it can have a, a certain power that puts you in a certain place um uh, in a frame of mind um very very often it goes into a, a certain situ in a certain direction though right and i usually when i play with other people that are uh and i sometimes feel like i'm getting beaten up in jiu-jitsu when i do that when i play with chris coleman or jojo or steve smith like um i i usually try to think about melody and think about contrast and think about um complementary things to play you know i'd um to to yeah do that maybe a little bit differently than of of course i mean the the thing is like okay you play four bars i play four bars and i play the hi-hat through and, <laughs> and you go crazy and then i'm like and this is this is fun too but i um I think there's also some other stuff that that can be done and can be interesting but um yeah i i find it fascinating but uh it's um it's not my main focus or it's not um it also is something like um i i cannot watch that like for for a long long time i sometimes like see that and be like oh wow but then it's it, it's like that it's like an it's like an action movie and after a while i'm saying okay enough explosions I want to see some beauty or see or hear a story or you know stuff like that yeah I, I i respect that so it's like it's something you checked out you you dabbled with and then then decided that that's that's one way but that's that's not the approach that that best fits for you and i completely agree that especially taken out of context because like you'll see these berkeley sheds and a lot of these guys if you watch them play with a band or in church 95 percent of it is just 
grooving and the occasional fill but right. you're taking it out right. of context when they get to chop and then people will see that on instagram and think that like that's that's everything they do so there's a little bit of a compression of of the reality that happens um yeah and i think that's also fair you know when you especially when you're a side man and 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 you do that a lot and then you finally meet another drummer and you blow off some steam together amazing <laughs> i mean i totally get that uh totally yeah fine which leads me to another thing and maybe maybe it's the last question we have time for uh which is that you covered a couple of years ago attack of the 10 pound pizza uh by vinnie mm -hmm. um which mm -hmm. was was definitely in my headphones as i was growing up and mm -hmm. you you did you did it justice you played the shit out of it but you also did it very differently than vinnie so to me that that shows that number one you were a fan of Vinny, you were checking Vinny out but also that you were going after a different aesthetic and you were completely comfortable doing your own thing and it didn't I, I guess the question here is like i do a lot of covers on my channel I, i like i like to try to step into other drummers shoes and and try to do or try to play over the things they played over but very often mm. i find it's difficult to escape constantly being in relation to this other player like how absolutely how do you deal with that and and how do you like respect what somebody else did before you but then forge your own new relationship with the music pa i mean i don't do that very often so it's not a it's not a real thing that i then constantly am confronted with um i think the easiest way to get away from this is to write your own music i would say like i to 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 actually not have that template that you then have to get away from. I, I, I remember I one, one, once talked to Steve Smith and he told me about this guy that wanted uh, him to record on his album. And <laughs> one funny thing that he says, like, you know what's really, really great about this guy? He doesn't send any demos. And I'm like, what? And he said like, yeah, because as soon as you as you hear a demo like with a programmed drum beat even you cannot shake that you have that in your mind and you're saying oh damn i would maybe i would have thought that half time <laughs> but now i have this in my head and i can't ah oh, it, it this feels righter now than than the other thing so um this is a thing i mean there is uh, i don't think you can really ever escape that and the other extreme would be to be like oh i have to do something else this is also stupid because because maybe what ringo played or what winnie played in that song is the best thing uh, that that can be played and and if you then just have to do something to do something different then maybe you choose something that's not as good but I, that's tough that's tough uh, to decide um for me i i found that moving thing uh incredibly interesting i even found the song interesting um i transcribed it when i was studying music and then when i did the a cappella thing with the grapefruit stuff it, it just like poked me to be like man it would be great to to do that too and Back then I experimented with uh, making that phrase a little bit longer, like uh, Vinny did it, um, I think even more deceptively because it's so it's so straight and it's then even less identifiable when, when it kind of jumps uh, uh, back and forth. And I made the phrase longer, which almost makes it sound smoother in a way and gives away the trick maybe a little bit more, but, but then, yeah. And and of course, like solo wise, I I then do do my stuff, and 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 of course, um, would be foolish to to try to get to Vinny's uh, level there. But yeah, I mean, but that's the thing in general, right? Like when you it, it ties into that thing before of like competition and doing your thing. I now do uh, was invited to play with the Buddy Rich big band, and this is kind of the same category where you have these arrangements and these songs and. I sometimes feel I, I, um, I have some songs. I have to be honest. I'm, I'm almost more inspired, or I'm more not more inspired, but more influenced, um, just like historically by how Vinny played that stuff or Weckl played that stuff on these Buddy Rich tapes, you know, because I heard that so so often. I had to go back and be like, oh, let me listen to the originals. Oh, you know, they're again very different, and and then you have all of this stuff in your head and. And then you realize, oh, when I want to 
play it differently, it might be different, but it might not work anymore. So in, in big band, there are really a couple of these setups that the brass guys understand. And if you just don't do them, then you're you're basically sabotaging a little bit the, the clarity of everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And and you don't want to be that guy either. So <laughs> um, it's tough. It's a balancing act. I, I, yeah, exactly. And then so 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 how can you maintain the clarity and also the function in the music and still not feel like completely um completely um yeah caged in but when i did that the first time um i had the fortune of um uh, having the contact of 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 dave weckel and i and and he did it the year before and i called him up and i was like basically we came to that point where i said like man this is kicking my ass this stuff and <laughs> And I said, like, I can't play it, like, but he plays it. And and Wecker said, like, yeah, no one can. So just do your thing and, and relax. And I'm like, oh, okay. So if Wecker even says that, okay. <laughs> so nice. yeah. Well, serendipitously, that's a fantastic note to end on. It's it's almost like fate <laughs> wove this interview to a close in, in the perfect place. <laughs> Is there anything you want to leave the audience with before we sign off? Any additional thoughts you want to say? Oh, just thanks uh, for the interest. Thanks for the for the great questions. Um, hope we see each other some day in the future. Also, everyone out there, maybe we see each other on tour or you check me out on on all kinds of channels. Um, but yeah, just thanks for your interest and your time. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed this. Thanks. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much. Speak soon. Awesome. Bye-bye.